Okay, so today is going to be the final part to Bond Servants of the Master series. Um, I, we'll see how it goes. I don't know if we'll split this up into two sort of shorter halves or one long hour, if that makes sense. We'll just see how we get through it. Um, I've titled today, Respect, Dignity, and Honor. Um, so, and actually today, it, I almost started a new series today. Um, but I think we'll finish this one first. And it will act, today will actually be a nice foundation and it will segue nicely into the next series that we're going to do, that will start next week. Um, just so you guys know, we're going to begin a series on honor and shame. Honor and shame in scripture. Um, it's, it's something that, you know when you read your scriptures again and you're like, oh my goodness, this is what it was pointing to. It, it's helping me understand and view things in a different way. So I'm really excited actually about doing this honor and shame series. But let's tie this off first. And the, the premise will be how, how are we to act honorably as bond servants of the master so, um, who, who here knows the difference between respect and dignity? Because if you ask someone today, like in the modern day, most people tend to lump these terms together. Um, same with honor. Like they're all connected, but there is a difference. So, um, respect is something that is earned or merited. You've, like, you've done something, therefore you've gained my respect. You, it's, respect is something that is earned uh, because, and it adds value. Um, if you treat someone with respect, it's honorable, okay? Now, dignity, it's slightly different in, in that it's this idea that everyone has a value. You place value on the individual, and you don't have to respect someone to treat them with dignity, if that makes sense. So, uh, let, let you meet your enemy. The parable of the Samaritan, uh, the Good Samaritan, is a really good example of this. That uh, if you understand the culture of the time, Samaritans and Jews hated each other in the first century. Now, the, the good Samaritan saw a Jew and he treated him with dignity because he valued him as a human being. He valued him, he cared for him. So respect and dignity are connected, but they're yet independent. Now to treat someone with respect and dignity is honorable, it's honorable. So I just wanna get that sort of define correctly as we move forward because today is going to be all about respect and specifically dignity. I want to really hone in on this. Um, now we as a Western society, we're completely disconnected from this honor shame mentality. This is why we don't understand say what uh, I Islam does. This is why we don't understand certain things that maybe like Chinese and Japanese people do because we, we're in a guilt and innocence-based mindset, whereas for them it's honor and shame. So, and the thing is, is scripture was very much honor and shame, very much. Um, now, because we're completely disconnected from this mindset, it actually results us in having generally no honor and acting in a shameful way, and we don't even realize it because we've got no concept of it, no, not um, consciously anyway. Um, not knowing about it or having it means that we cannot guard it. We cannot guard, like, we cannot guard dignity. Well, we're good with dignity, but honor. Like, what does it mean to actually be honorable? Um, because we, we have a jaded view of what this is. Um, now, you might ask, why even look into this topic if our society doesn't live by it? Um, Though Western society doesn't act and live according to these principles, they're still embedded in our subconscious. Uh, this is why, you know, oh, a situation will occur, whatever it is, and it's like, how dare they? They have disrespected me. That's honor and shame playing out right there. Um, so we, we, without us realizing it, we still do uh, operate in that space, just not in a, such a pronounced way, say, as the East. Um, more importantly, Elohim works to honor and shame. The whole of the scripture is all about honor and shame. 
Every time you see in the ISR or the Hallelujah Scriptures, when you see esteem, like in the King James, it will say glory. A better, we need to understand it in the terms of honor and respect and reverence. All these things, we've got to remember that they lived in a, in a society where they had a king. And the king was, you gave the king honor. Now, because we're so disconnected from honor and shame, it means that quite often we come before Elohim without giving him the due proper honor. Um, you know, this, this whole mentality of, yo, big G, how's it going? Or, do you know what I mean? It, treating him like your friend. Like, and it's like, he's a king. Not only is he a king, he's the king of universe. I mean, there's lightning bolts coming from him, flames coming from him. Like, the heavens cannot contain him. And we just kind of rock on up, misquoting Hebrews of saying, let's have boldness and treat it all very casually. You know, uh, I... A really good example of this is asking for a parking space. <laughs> you know, we've, we've all kind of done it. I know, and it's like, what do you mean? There's nothing, it's like, you're coming before the creator of everything and you're gonna ask for a parking space. Do, do, do you see what I'm getting at? It's like, Solomon says that Yah is up in the heavens and you are here on earth. So when you draw near to him, let your words be few. There's great wisdom in that, and unfortunately, because we're disconnected from honor, shame, uh, king, and subjects, we're in, in this this idea of patronage, um, we just completely lose sight of it, and we disrespect Elohim without meaning to. We do it in ignorance, but we do it nonetheless. Um, so today, I kind of want to look at the dynamics in um, dignity. More, it's, it's going to be more about dignity today within the believer's life. Now, firstly, guarding our own honor and dignity. How do, how do we behave and how does that affect our dignity and honor? And very closely related to that is guarding each other's dignity. Because the minute you have two people or two parties interact, um, if, if, if one disrespects the other party, there's, there's shame and disrespect going on. And I just, yeah. And also, intriguingly, I want to look at how Elohim guards our dignity. It's amazing that Elo, the way Elohim treats sinners, he treats them with great dignity. It doesn't mean, now we start to see the difference between respect and dignity. Because as we're going to see, Yah doesn't respect sin or a sinner, but he still treats them with dignity. So, um, I'm actually going to start off with how Elohim guards our dignity. Let's go to Deuteronomy uh, 25. Deuteronomy 25. Um, and we're going to start in the first verse, actually. Deuteronomy 25. When there is a dispute between men... Then they shall come unto judgment, and they shall be judged. And the righteous declared righteous, and the wicked declared wicked. And it shall be, if the wicked is to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten in his presence with the number of blows according to his wickedness. Forty blows he gives him, but no more, lest he beat him with many more blows than these, and your brother be degraded before your eyes." Here we see, we see what uh, this idea of guarding dignity comes in now. Because Yah's not, he's not foregoing punishment. He's saying, no, you need to meet out punishment, but you do not degrade your brother. You do not degrade him. He's, um, he's a human being. He's created in the image of Yah. He has a certain value. And it would be shameful to degrade him. It brings shame upon him. Now, th this is why... Uh, the Jews did the 40 minus 1. So that you, you, when, when they gave you 40 lashes, they gave you 39. Because they didn't want to fall foul of this command. It was their little way of protecting it. Now, this is where the Romans took it further. And other cultures, when they whipped and scourged someone, they didn't stick to 40. Not only was it very obviously painful and it tore your flesh off your back, but it was actually a way of degrading someone. 
in front of everyone. It was an act of shaming them publicly because th th there would come a point when you cannot take it no more. And when, th this is when you see grown men cry. It was degrading. So it wasn't so much about, people back then were used to pain. A lot, like the men were expected to be in war and things like that. So th they were not afraid of pain, but they were, now shame, that was completely different. But here, the point I want to make is that this is a person that deserves punishment. And yet Yah still gives them dignity. And he says, you will uphold that. You will uphold it. The dishing out of punishment must be firm, but honorable. There's a way of dealing things honorably. Now, punishment must never degrade anyone. The, the way this can go south as well is when someone receives the punishment and then you hold it, you, you, you continue to hold it against them. It's a form of degrading them. Um, let's go to Deuteronomy 21. Deuteronomy 21 and verse 10. This is a uh, portion of scripture that the atheists love to use against us. When you go out to fight against your enemies, and Yah your Elohim shall give them into your hands, and you shall take them captive, and shall see among the captives a woman of lovely form, and shall delight in her and take her for your wife, then you shall bring her home to your house, and she shall shave her head and trim her nails, and put aside the mantle of her captivity, and shall dwell in your house, and mourn her father and her mother a month of days. And after that you shall go into her and be her husband, and she shall be be your wife. And it shall be, if you are not pleased with her, then you shall let her go at her desire. But you do not sell her at all for silver. Do not treat her harshly since you have humbled her. So again, because we're so disconnected from warrior culture and honor shame culture, you have to remember when the men went out to the war, like, so here it says, put aside the mantle of her captivity. It was quite common for when the men were out at war or they knew the enemy was nearby, the women would dress nicely. Because if the man took them, that was their only way of survival. If you weren't a virgin, you'd probably be get, you'd get killed, especially by the enemy. Now, here we see Elohim actually guarding the dignity of a prisoner of war. This is a prisoner of war. You have to remember that the women weren't involved in war making, it was all the men. It was the governments and the leaders, and they're the ones. And the women suffered. They were almost bystanders in, all, in war. Now, this may seem harsh, but actually this is a stark contrast to how the other nations used to operate. The other nations, they used to go in, they used to rape, pillage, they used to rip open the pregnant ladies, so that to cut off the seed. Like you read of this, that this is what Yah will send to Israel because of all their abominations. They will send the Babylonians and the Assyrians. Go read on the Assyrians how they dealt with their enemies. That it, not only was it very, uh, very graphic, it was very shameful. This is why they used to strip them naked and shave their head. Now, the other, this in comparison to what the other nations did was very merciful. He's saying, like, the women were the ones that suffered the most. They would have been sold into sex slavery. They would have been used as slaves. They would have been mistreated. They would have, they would have been treated like meat. And you are saying, no, if you're going to bring one of these women home, you make her your wife. You give her the privileges of a wife. And not only that, you're going to allow her to have mourning for a family. You've just killed all her family. Her husband, probably her sons, and so you've killed them. Give her the chance to mourn. 30 days. That was how, like, so Yah's even having dignity to a prisoner of war. Let's remember the women were bystanders in this. They, they didn't ask for this a lot of the time. So Yah's saying, no, 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 no. These, th this is caring for those that are powerless. Because a woman in the ancient world, on her own, was as good as dead. The only way you could survive as a woman back then on your own was by being a prostitute. And Yah is saying, no, you do not degrade people like this. Let's drop down, same chapter. Is everyone with me? Um, I know this is harsh, like, it's, you know, because we sanitize things. We live in this politically correct world. Um, drop down to verse uh, 22. 
Um, and when a man has committed a sin worthy of death, then he shall be put to death, and you shall hang him on a tree. Let his body not remain overnight on the tree, for you shall certainly bury him the same day. For he who is hanged is accursed of Elohim, so that you do not defile the land in which Yah your Elohim is giving you as an inheritance. Now, the act of hanging a body on the tree was actually a, a way of shaming that individual. Because in the ancient culture, your shame went after your death. It carried on after death. So you could be shamed in death. Uh, this is why the Roman crucifixion was very shameful. So here Yar is saying, th this is a person that's been worthy of punishment and they've had their punishment and they've been, the body's been hung. But this is where Yar shows the dignity because he says you give it a proper burial that day. Now th th this, like, okay, back then, if you didn't bury someone properly, it brought shame to them and their family. Now, this seems really alien to us, but Yar is saying, okay, you've hung the body on the tree, but you will give that man a proper burial. He has dignity. He's disrespected himself. He's shamed himself to be worthy on the tree, but you will maintain his dignity. And it wasn't about the man. It was about the offender's family because that shame would have gone to the family. So he's saying, no, you give them a proper burial. Now, bear in mind so far, like with the example of the 40 lashes and this example, we're talking about sinners. We're talking about people that have earned and incurred just punishment, yet you are saying, no, you treat them with respect. Interesting. You know, how do we treat those that stumble within the body is what I'm trying to get at. Okay, um, let's go to Leviticus 14. Leviticus 14. Hopefully, we're going through this, we'll see an aspect to Yah's character, which is truly admirable, actually. Leviticus 14, verse 1. This is about the cleansing of the leper. Um, Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, This shall be the Torah of the leper for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest. So, this is talking about the cleansing of the leper. Let's now drop down to verse 8. And he who is to be cleansed, i.e. the leper, shall wash his garments and shall shave off all his hair and wash himself in water and shall be clean. Then after that, he comes into the camp but shall stay outside his tent seven days. And on this, Now, remember, he would have had to go to the priest, probably in Jerusalem, to be declared clean. So he's not like, he's having to travel to Jerusalem, be declared clean, and then travel back home. So this is worth bearing in mind. And on the seventh day it shall be that he shaves all the hair off his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair he shaves off. And he shall wash his garments and wash his body in water and shall be clean. Now, what's really interesting about this is who does he look like now? A Nazarite. Let's go to Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6. Numbers chapter 6 and verse 13. Um, and this is the Torah of the Nazarite. When the days of his separation are completed, he is brought to the door of the tent of the appointment. And then it lists a load of offerings, but then jump down to verse 18. And after he's given all the offerings, the Nazarite shall shave the head of his separation at the door of the tent of appointment and shall take the hair from the head of his separation and shall put it on the fire, which is under the slaughtering of the peace offering. Now the head, we think of just the top. In Hebrew culture, it's everything. Everything. Do you see what I'm getting at? A, a, le a cleansed leper had the exact same physical look as a Nazarite who had finished his vow. Now, which one was shameful and which one was honorable? Right? Being a leper was considered shameful. They had to walk around, you know, covering their top lips, screaming out, unclean, unclean. No one could touch them. It was shameful to be a leper. They were outcasts of society. Now, bear in mind, the leper has to go to Jerusalem. 
the Nazarite has to go to Jerusalem. To what was Paul, Where did Paul go to do the Nazarite vows? He went to the temple at Jerusalem. This means that people are going to see you in public. People you don't know. Now, here's the beauty. They don't know whether you've been cleansed of leprosy or whether you've just finished your Nazarite vow. And there's one more parallel. Let's go to Numbers 8. Numbers 8, verse 5. And Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Take the Levites from among the children of Israel, and you shall cleanse them, and do this to cleanse them. Sprinkle water of the sin offering on them, and they shall shave all their body, and shall wash their garments, and cleanse themselves, and shall take a young bull with his grain offering of fine flour mixed with oil, while you take another... You see what I'm getting at? There's one look that for a cleansed leper, a Nazarite that's finished his vow, or that's had to start it again, should it become defiled, and a newly dedicated Levite. Now, the Levites were given honor because they were Levites. Yah gave them this honor. Can you see the dignity that Yah is protecting of the leper? They'd, They'd borne all that shame, being separated from society, from their family, And when they go to the temple, walking back from the temple back home, no one can judge them. They don't, like, there's no stigma attached. Oh, he he was a leper. Do you know what I mean? And what it does, it actually, not only does it protect the dignity, it prevents gossip all of a sudden. It prevents Lashon Hara, evil speech and defaming, because you don't know. You honestly don't know. The only people that would know are probably his locals. But he'll be just glad to get back home. You know, th- that reproach has been taken off him. We see how Elohim guards the dignity of a cleansed leper. This is huge, guys. Now think of what leprosy represents, right? We've done the Torah portion on this. It represents, like, it's associated with Lushon Harar, actually. Evil speech uh, and just the, the sin nature in us. Now being a leper was shameful. But it meant that a newly cleansed leper could not be stigmatized as he walked back from being cleansed. Like, think of that and apply it to you. When someone's committed or has been in shame, has been in sin, has been in the condition that is spiritual leprosy, and they've repented from that, do we give them an anonym, anonymity and do we treat them with dignity and respect and honor? We must not shame and stigmatize someone who is recovering from sin, inverted commas. All of us fall short. It's easy to say, well, he did this and he did that and blah, 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 blah. Then we get caught up in defaming and slandering people's characters. And you are saying, no, 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 no. Even the sinners, even the criminals, even the wives of your enemies, you treat them with dignity. You are a set apart people. You do not do as they do. Yeah. Okay, so it, again, let, let's keep going. This is just a scratch on the surface. Let's go to Leviticus 1. It turns out that in the very way that the offerings and the sacrifices were done, it guarded someone's honor and dignity and preserved them from having shame imputed to them. Let's start Leviticus 1, verse 1. Um, And Yah called to Moshe and spoke to him from the tent of the appointment, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When any one of you brings an offering to Yah, you bring the offering of your livestock of the herd or of the flock. It is, if his burnt offering is of the herd, let him bring a male, a perfect one. Let him bring it at the door of the tent of the appointment for his acceptance before Yah. So, We're going to start looking at what it means to be brought before the tent and being brought before Yah. And he, the person bringing the offering, shall lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. And he, the offender, shall slaughter the bull before Yah. People miss this. It's not the priest that killed it. It was the offending party. Because it's a substitution going on. Um... 
He shall slaughter the bull before Yah, and the sons of Aharon, the Kohenim, shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood all around the altar, which is at the door of the tent of the appointment. And he shall skin the burnt offering and cut it into its pieces. And the sons of Aharon, the Kohen, shall put it on the fire of the altar and lay wood in order on the fire. And the sons of Aharon, the Kohenim, shall arrange the pieces with the head and the fat and the wood, which is on the fire of the altar, and so forth. Now let's drop drop down to verse 10 and if his offering is from the flock from the sheep or from the goats as a burnt offering let him bring a male a perfect one and he shall slaughter it on the north side of the altar before Yah and the sons of Aharon and the Kohenim shall sprinkle its blood on the altar all around so what we have we have someone bringing an offering laying his hands on the offering killing it And then the priest does accordingly to what needs to be done. Now, in verse 5, it says that this is done. um, Sorry, verse 3, it says, let him bring it before the door of the tent of the appointment. Verse 5 calls it, he shall slaughter the bull before Yah. Verse 11 says that this is on the north side of the altar. So what you would have, you, you, you would come in from the east, you would have the altar... And obviously you're coming in here, you would have the steps going to the altar here, you would have the laver and the thing. So basically the north side of the altar, there was a nice open space. And this is where all the animals, all the offerings were slaughtered on the north side. Now, um, and I forgot to mention on the east of the altar was the ashes. So basically there was only the north of the altar, which is where you could slaughter offerings. So just bear that in mind, that's the process. You bring your offering, you, you, do the, you put your hands on it, you slit its throat, the priest does whatever, and you, all this is done at the north side of the altar. So that's for the alarm, the burnt offering. Now, the burnt offerings, some of them were prescribed, as they demanded. Some of them were free will. You could give free will burnt offerings. So the dedication of the temple, Solomon slaughtered hundreds of thousands of animals as free will burnt offerings. Um... Okay, let's go to Leviticus chapter 3. Now, bear in mind that the burnt offering was not a sin offering. It was not a sin offering. It was just that, a burnt offering. Uh, Let's look at chapter 3, and now we're going to look at the Shalomim, which is the peace offerings. Um, If that which he presents is a peace offering, now these were voluntary, or they were sometimes they were part of vows. So when you completed a Nazarite vow, say you would have to bring some peace offering. So peace offerings, some were prescribed, a lot of them would have been free will. Um, If he brings a peace offering, he is bringing it of the herd, whether male or female, he brings a perfect one before Yah. And he shall lay his hand on the head of his offering and slaughter it at the door of the tent of the appointment. So again, this is why I went through with the burnt offering, what it means to be slaughtered at the door of the tent. This would have been on the north side. And the sons of Aharon and the Kohenim shall sprinkle the blood and the altar all around. Um, uh, And it's the same process. Um, You take the fat, you take the entrails, you wash the kidneys... They, and they burn it. Now, verse 5, And the sons of Aharon shall burn it on the altar upon the burnt offering, which is on the wood, which is on the fire, which is an offering made by fire. So they were burnt in the same place on the altar. Um, and then verse 7, If he is bringing a lamb as his offering, then he shall bring it before Yah and shall lay his hand on the head of the offering. So, What we see here is that the burnt offering and the peace offering look exactly the same. Now, let's go to Leviticus 4. We're going to look briefly at the chatat, which is, um, it's a sin offering, but this is sin offering for unintentional sin. This is not a willful rebellion. Uh, Yah spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel. When a being sins by mistake against any of the commands of Yah, which are not to be done, and shall do any of them, if the anointed priest sins, bringing guilt on the people, then he shall bring to Yah for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bull, a perfect one, as a sin offering, and he shall bring the bull to the door of the tent of the appointment before Yah, and shall lay his hand on the bull's head and slaughter the bull before Yah. So we know this is on the north side. It's the same 
process, the same process, drop down to verse 13. If the entire congregation of Israel strays by mistake and the matter has been hidden from the eyes of the assembly and they have done any of the commands of Yah which are not to be done and shall be guilty, when the sin which they have sinned becomes known, then the assembly shall bring a young bull for the sin and bring it before the tent of appointment and the elders of the congregation shall lay their hands on the head of the bull before Yah and the bull shall be slaughtered before Yah. Drop down to verse 22. When a ruler sins by mistake, same process. Verse 24, he lays his hands on the head of the goat. The ruler would have to bring a goat. And finally, drop down to verse 27. If any being of the people, so people like you and I, just normal people, if they sin by mistake and it's been made known, verse 28, his offering shall be a female goat, in verse 29, he shall lay his hand on the head of the sin offering and slaughter the sin offering at the place of the burnt offering. So, so far, the burnt offering, which was not for sin, the peace offering, which was not for sin, these now look identical to a sin offering in process, in how it functions and how it's all done. Um, let's drop down to chapter 5. This is talking of the Asham. Um, the, hang on, yeah, the, hang on, verse, chapter, yeah, it's talking of the Isham. When any being sins in that which he has heard the voice of swearing and is a witness or has seen or has not and has known but does not reveal it, he shall bear his wickedness. Or when a being touches any unclean matter or the carcass of an unclean beast or the carcass of an unclean livestock or the carcass of an unclean creeping creature and it has been hidden from him, he is unclean and guilty. Um, or when he touches the uncleanness of a man or any of his uncleanness by which he is unclean and it has been hidden from him, when he shall know, he shall be guilty. Uh, so these are all unintentional sins. Now, verse 5, it shall be when he is guilty of one of these that he shall confess that in which he has sinned and shall bring his guilt offering to Yah for which... For his sin in which he has sinned, a female from the flock, a lamb or a female goat as a sin offering, and the Kohen shall make atonement for him for his sin. Um, and it would have been the same process. Now let's go to Leviticus 6 verse 25. Speak to Aharon and his son, saying, this is the Torah of the sin offering. In the place where the burnt offering is slaughtered, the sin offering is slaughtered before Yah. It is most set apart. So you kill him in the same place. And then Leviticus 7, verse 2. The guilt offering is slaughtered in the place where they slaughter the burnt offering. And its blood is sprinkled all around on the altar. I've labored this because first, I don't want you to take my word for it. But secondly, all of these were slain at the north side of the altar... The offerer would have had to lay his hands on the animal before slaughtering it in all the aforementioned sacrifices. It was the same process. This actually means that no one knew the reason why you were offering a sacrifice. No one knew, except for the officiating priest, because you would have to confess to the priest your sin. The priest was the only one, and he was essentially the face of Elohim in that moment. So you're confessing to Elohim, but no one knew while you were bringing a sacrifice. Your privacy, your dignity was preserved. What does this prevent? Gossip. Gossip. Now, by the way, only the officiating priest would know the sin. Uh, this, is, uh, this is to leadership out there. Keep anonymity of what people come to you. Look, you guys have come to me with sensitive issues. I respect that. Why? Because you have dignity. And I honour you by respecting your privacy. That, like, Yah hates people talking about other people behind their back. He hates it. So any leadership out there in internet land that might be listening, keep your mouth shut. Keep your mouth shut. Now, the way this was done was to prevent God... Imagine, okay that you, you slaughter the peace offering here, you slaughter the sin offering here, you slaughter the trespass here, and they've all got separate places. And someone comes along, you can already see what's going on. Oh, where's he going? Is he going, oh, no, he's gone past peace offering. Oh, oh, oh he's a sinner. 
Oh, shame on him. No. Yah, Yah, even in the act of sin, Yah is preserving your dignity. Why can't we do the same? We, and we, it, the thing is, it's because we don't have a concept of honor and shame. Um, the sacrificial process guards the honor and dignity of the offending party. You look like everybody else. You look like everybody else. Elohim guards the dignity of a sinner. So he guards the dignity of his people, of the sinners, of the enemy. Like, if Elohim goes to such great lengths to guard the honor of sinners, why can't we guard each other's honor? Why can't we guard each other's dignity? Like, you were all created in the image of Yah. Your enemy is created in the image of Yah. That, this is where dignity and respect separate. You don't have to respect someone to give them dignity. This adds a whole new depth to confessing our sins to one another, doesn't it? Guard their honor, guard their dignity. Let's remember, trust takes a while to build. Respect takes a while to build. It's shattered in a second. Yeshua guards honor, believe it or not. We're going to get a lot more in depth into this in the honor and shame series, but let's uh, Matthew 18, verse 15. You should know this is the Matthew 18 process. If your brother sins against you, go and reprove him between you and him alone. Alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not hear, take with you one or two more, not the whole world, not all of Facebook. Take one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word might be established. And if he refuses to hear them, say it to the assembly. And if he refuses to hear the assembly, let him be to you like a Gentile and a tax collector. This is the honorable way of dealing with someone. Because you're giving the person the opportunity to repent at every stage. And not only that, you are guarding the honor and the dignity as much as is physically possible every stage of the way. You are giving them privacy. You know, when, this is why, like, again, we need, this adds to confessing your sins to one another. There's a way of doing it. There's a way of doing it. There's a way of dealing with people's sin that is honorable. You know, th- the reason I mention this is because wh- where people go too far the other way is that they don't approach people because it's like, oh, well, I don't want to make a fuss. I don't want to make a fuss. And, and all the while, something is going on in the background. And it's just like, no, you have, to do, you have to be able to come to the person, but do it with honor. Do it, respect the integrity of privacy. Okay, why give dignity? Um, I've already mentioned this, but um, you don't have to turn there. In Genesis 1.26, when Yah creates man... Elohim said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the Shamaim, and the, over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creeping creatures that creep on the ground. And Elohim created the man in his image, in the, Elohim, in the image of Elohim he created him, male and female he created them. Yah upholds the dignity of everyone, of all his creation, both righteous and unrighteous. This is, this is a lot more common in Eastern culture, especially maybe in like Japanese and Chinese culture. They will still honor those they do not like. Because if not, it incurs shame on them. And we're called to love one another. Paul actually says, honor one another. Honor Elohim with your bodies. And with, right? There's a way of... De- I'm not saying you have to go around, you know fake smiling and oh, I love you that's not what it's saying but dignity Dig- I-, I know I'm really laboring this but oh, it's so important we are called to be like our heavenly father we're called to be like him now if this is how he treats everyone why do we fall short as his people and I'm speaking generally here I'm not attacking you guys I'm, sp- I'm-, I'm talking to everyone Elohim gives out wrath to those that do not uphold the dignity of his creation, especially the poor and the disadvantaged. It infuriates him, actually. Let's look at some examples. Deuteronomy 24 and verse 10. Um, 
Deuteronomy 24 and verse 10. When you, lend, when you lend your brother alone, do not go into his house to get his pledge. Stand outside and let the man to whom you lend bring out the pledge. I mean, think about this. Let's say um, you borrow, I don't know, whatever off me, a thousand pounds, and I and you give me a pledge. Hold this. This is my proof. I will read. How disrespectful and shameful of me it would be to go into your house and go, give me that pledge. What does that make me? Th- what does that say? I'm thinking about you. Th- this is how people exploit one another, and then they'll use debt. Oh well, you owe me this, and then all of a sudden you're in the palm of someone's hand. It's, um, stand uh, verse twelve. If the man is poor, do not sleep with his pledge. By all means, return the pledge to him at sundown, and he shall sleep in your, his own garment and shall bless you, and it shall be righteousness to you before Yah your Elohim. He's, th- look, he, he doesn't say give it back to him before sundown if he pays you back. You give it back to him regardless. Why? Because you are guarding his dignity. He's a human being. He's got the right to sleep warm. He's got the right to be clothed. Do not oppress a hired servant who is poor and needy of your brothers or of the, str- of the strangers in, who is in your land within your gates. This is, to, this is now those outside of the camp. Give him his wages on the same day and do not let the sun go down on it. For he is poor and lifts up his being to it so that he does not cry out against you to Yah and it shall be sin to you. Father are not put, fathers are not put to death for their children and children are not put to death for their fathers. Each is to die for his own sin. So again, like, you'll see this, oh, he's the son or daughter of so-and-so, you know. Oh. You, you cannot shame a child for what their parents have done and vice versa. You know, some parents, like, you have parents that have, say, like, two children. One's really good and one's really bad. Is the parent now to be shamed for that? Come on, it's like, but we do this. And we do, the thing is, we might not say it, but we do it in here. And unfortunately for us, Yah judges the heart. You know, you, you can fool people with what your words and, you know, but you can't fool Yah with what's going on in your heart. Father, uh, verse 17, do not twist the right ruling of a stranger or the fatherless, nor take the garment of a widow, but you shall remember that you were a slave in Mitzrayim and that Yah your Elohim redeemed you from there. Therefore, I'm commanding you this. Remember where you came from. Don't be a hypocrite. You were there yourself. When you reap your harvest in your field and have forgotten a sheaf in the field, do not go back to get it. Let it be for the stranger or the fatherless and for the widow, so that Yah your Elohim might bless you in all the work of your hands. And then, it, yeah, when you beat your olives, do not examine the branch behind you. Let it be for the stranger or for the fatherless or the widow. When you gather grapes of your vineyard, do not glean behind you. Let it be for the stranger, for the fatherless and the widow. And you shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Mitzrayim. Therefore, I'm commanding you this word. The thing is, we've got this idea of the more we hold on to, the more we have. And Yah is saying, no, I give you everything. Take what you need, give to the poor, you'll have more. It's a supernatural thing. It's like, for example, uh, tithing is a really good example of this. Like, my my 80%, because I put aside some for uh, where I'm spiritually fed, and some for the feasts, so that I've always got something for the feast, so we can rejoice. Rejoicing costs money. But my 80% goes far further than my 100% ever did. It, it, it doesn't make sense mathematically on paper. But I always had more money. Like, and th- that's my personal witness. Where, what you do is between you and the Father. Um, there's a parallel passage to this. Uh, let's go to Exodus 22:21. 21. Exodus chapter 22, verse 21. Now, what's, this gives you like another little extra detail to all this, uh, 22, 21. Uh, 
Do not tread down a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Mitzrayim. Do not afflict any widow or fatherless child. If you do afflict them at all, if they cry out to me at all, I shall certainly hear their cry, and my wrath shall burn, and I shall slay you with the sword, and your wives shall be widows, and your children fatherless. If you do lend silver to any of my people, the poor among you, you are not to be like one that lends on interest to him. Do not lay interest on him. If you take your neighbor's garment as a pledge, you are to return it before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering. It is his garment for his skin. What does he sleep in? And it shall be that when he cries to me, I shall hear, for I show favor. Now, what was one of the primary reasons Israel got booted out of the land? Because they did all those things. They oppressed the poor. They oppressed the widows. They injustice in, in right ruling. Now, verse 28 is a corker. Do not revile your Elohim, nor curse the ruler of your people. This is in the context of not oppressing the poor and the needy, which means that when you do oppress them, you revile Elohim. It means you revile him. Now, why is Yah saying, don't do this? Why? It's all to do with dignity. And he even included the stranger, those outside of the camp, Everyone has the right to be treated with dignity. Proverbs 14. Proverbs 14 and verse 31. Proverbs 30, 14 and verse 31. Um... He who oppresses the poor reproaches his maker. But he who esteems him shows favor to the needy. By his own evil doing, the wicked is thrust down, but the righteous has a refuge in death. I, I, I can't stress enough how Yah, this... This is why we need to guard dignity. Because if we don't, Yah's wrath comes against us. Why? Because it's the equivalent of thumbing our nose to him and spitting. We're shaming him. It's all to do with honor shame. We shame him by how we treat one another and how we treat those outside the world. Because this brings his name in disrepute. We're the ones that bear his name. Now, we normally think of name as authority. It's also to do with public portrayal. Like when someone said, I come in the name of, if you came in the name of the king, wow, there was honor to that. You know, so the, the name also has to do with reputation. What are we doing to his name, our name, and each other's name? Let's take a break here and we'll carry on after. Yeah, amen? Okay, um, I hope that the first half kind of was, gave us a really nice insight into some of Yah's character. That uh, it really shows his mercy and his goodness coming forth, like uh, justice but mercy. You see this quite a lot. The the two sides to Yah: justice and mercy, justice and compassion. Um, so now that we've kind of looked at um, honor dignity let's get more into the practical application of b between brother and sister like let's get practical again um i want to quote first peter 4 8 you'll know it straight away when you see it um it says above all have fervent love for one another because love covers a great number of sins. Now, we're going to unpack this, and actually it's amazing how much this has to do with guarding one another's honor and dignity. Um, so let, let's dig into how we cover... Look, think about this. Love covers a great number of sins. Will your brother sin? If you love your brother, will you broadcast it to the world? 
No, you shouldn't. So already you see, like, because you love your brother, even though he sinned, you will guard his dignity. Love covers sin. This is why Matthew 18 is so amazing. Because you love your brother, not only are you reproving him, but you're doing it in private. Love covers sin. Privacy and dignity is all tied into this. Um, Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 14. 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 4. Again, this is a really famous passage, but I want to tie this in to dignity and honor. Love is patient. Love is kind. 13. What did I say? Oh, sorry. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4. Um, yeah. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Now, what's really interesting is that boasting, this term, is, can be, um, in the first century Greek mindset, it can be linked to, um, you know how you had different social classes and people want to climb the social ladder? That boasting can be linked to that. You're, you're seeking, you're boasting and trying to seek greater honor, though you don't necessarily have it. Um, which was a really interesting thing I picked up. Um, It's not puffed up. It does not behave indecently. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked, and it reckons not the evil. Now, the word for reckons in the Greek is logizomai, and it literally means to take an inventory, to, to, to hold an account. In the King James, it might be translated as impute, to impute something to someone. And what he's saying is that love does not take an account in the sense of um, you don't hold something against them. You don't hold it against them. So if you've truly forgiven someone, should that past transgression even factor in making a decision? No, because that means technically you haven't forgiven them. It means you haven't forgiven them. True love will not hold to account. If that was the case, we're all going into the lake of fire. Because, yeah, we've all earned that. What does he say? Your sin shall be as far from the east as it is to the west. I shall remember it no more. He doesn't hold you to account. Thank goodness. So why, you know, we, we all fall into this and we do it indirectly like... On a more subtle level is, why don't you trust someone? If someone's wronged you, I'm talking beyond, you know, not trusting someone for wisdom's sake. I'm talking more in the sense of someone's truly repented. If they've truly repented, why don't you trust them? Because that means that you're holding them to account for something they've done. Uh, We mentioned this in the break. Prisoners that pay for their crimes. Let's say someone's done armed robbery. They spend 15 years in jail. They go out. Society holds that against them. They, they can't get a job because it's been, even though they've paid for it, it's been held to their account. That's dishonorable. It's shameful. When Elohim forgives us our sin, does he remember it and hold it into account? So again, love does not boast, is not puffed up, does not behave indecently. It does not seek its own. It's not provoked. It reckons not the evil. If you truly love someone, you won't hold things into account. It does not rejoice over unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love will not let someone slip into sin. It says here, if you truly love someone and you have the love that does not rejoice over unrighteousness, this means that when you see your brother in unrighteousness, you will reprove him. What's the Deuteronomy equivalent to this? I think it's Deuteronomy. It was a Torah equivalent. It says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. You shall surely reprove him. Now, Yeshua tells us how to do that honorably. You, You know, guarding someone's privacy does not mean you don't take something up. There's a way to do these things honorably. Verse 7, love covers all. It covers everything, everything. So within that, we should be thinking forgiveness, compassion, mercy, long-suffering. Now, all these attributes, forgiveness, compassion, and mercy, does the offending party deserve them? No. You do not deserve compassion. You've not merited compassion and mercy. That's that's, uh, giving, though you do not deserve it. So when it says that love covers all, 
It covers all. It believes all. It expects all. So ex expectation, it, it, it hopes for. So this idea of it hopes for all, and then it endures all. Can you go on a journey with a brother? Like, you know, just because you're having disagreements, like, can we go on a journey together? And can our love for one another, because we're all made in the image of Yah, can it cover it? And can we guard that privacy? Can we believe that there will be a resolve? Can we have hope and expectation that there will be a resolve? And will you endure the process, even if it sucks? The thing is, though, we're just a bunch of wusses, in the, in the, you know, and we, we get our, ourselves in such a tissel ever so easily and like, ever so offended. Here it doesn't say, uh, love does all these things except if you get offended. It t this is taking, it's expecting you that if you're offended, you're going to do all these things. Are you able, once you're going on a journey with a brother, are you able to see past his fallen nature? We're all going to screw up within, with him, with one another, husbands to wives, and just everywhere. We're going to screw up. Can we go on that journey and can we see past that? You know, do we have that hope? Does love expect? Does love hope for something more? How quickly do you give up on someone? We do this. Oh, they're too, they're too far gone, too far gone. You know, sometimes you might have to do that decision. It might actually, you know, Matthew 18, if it gets to the point where the whole congregation is holding someone to account and they still don't listen, send them off. But there's always a chance for them to return. And that lifeline always needs to be there on the account of true repentance. How quickly do you give up on someone? And I'm pointing this more so at leadership. Leadership. Leadership, you're going to have to deal with shenanigans. You know, I mentioned this last week. I'm counting on shenanigans. It's human nature. Now, do you give up on people just because they've fallen? He didn't. He never gave. When I was off in the world, the amount of stupid stuff I did and the, the ways I shamed my creator. Walk with me long enough and you'll find out how much I shamed my creator. He never gave up on me. Never. Like looking back, there were even times that I can see it now that even when I was knee deep, like up to sin in here, I can see that he was still guiding me. He was able to see past my immediate situation and see me stood here. Can we do that with our brothers and sisters? Too often we, we, we're too focused here and now. And yeah, we need to kind of transcend this and kind of, I think I've made my point. <laughs> More importantly, verse 8, love never fails. It never, never fails. If you put all these principles, guard honor, guard privacy, and you're willing to cover everything, to believe in someone, to expect to have hope and to endure it, it should never fail. It should always... We read in Romans a few weeks ago that do you not know that the mercy and compassion of Elohim should lead to repentance? We need to be showing that same mercy and compassion. Right, let's go to Psalm 32. This, this is, by the way, is the type of love that Yeshua is asking of us. Love your enemy. Love your enemy. Uh, Psalm 32. Psalm 32, and we're going to begin at verse 1. A poem of David. Blessed is he who has transgression, whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Now, what did we just read in 1 Peter 4 8? What covers a multitude of sins? Love. Now, what did we cover in the whole of the first half? How does Elohim deal with sin? Does he show dignity to the person? Does he keep their sin private? Let's remember, you brought your offering, no one knew if it was a free will, if it was for sin, if it was for peace. They didn't know. It was the same process. Love covers a multitude of sin. And look, what is the transgression, what is the sin covered by? 
love. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, why his sin has been covered by love, by love. How did Elohim deal with the sinner? With dignity. He covered them. He afforded them anonymity. I can't even say that word. And again, like, can we afford the same thing to our brothers and sisters? How should we deal with each other in our trespasses against him and one another? Verse 2, blessed is the man to whom Yah imputes no wickedness and in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now, what did we read just earlier? 1 Corinthians 13, 5, love does not hold to account. It's the same word, logizomai, it's the Hebrew equivalent to hold something to account. And here it's saying, blessed is the man whom Yah does not hold to account for his wickedness. And in whose spirit there is no deceit. Now what's interesting is that having no wickedness imputed to you is conditional on you having no deceit in your spirit. Because it's easy to come to Yah and say, oh, forgive me. And then, is, is it true forgiveness? This should bring up the idea of what Yeshua says when you bring your offering or your gift to the altar. Go resolve what you have with your brother. Because if not, your offering is actually unacceptable. Why? Because there's deceit in your spirit. You're expecting forgiveness, yet not dishing it out. Is our dealing with our brother's trespass from a place of guarding their dignity? How do we deal with it? Do, do we want to protect it? Because if you're trying to deal with your brother's trespass without dignity, there's deceit in your spirit. Uh, this is more aimed at any leadership, but let's say someone, how do you deal with the situation? Is the driver for the situation so you can have peace and quiet in your congregation, or are you going to deal with it righteously, even if it takes a bit more from you for the good of everybody else, so that the, the party can see maybe, what, do you see what I'm trying to get at? What's the driver for wanting to deal with, you know, are you trying to just make life easy for yourself, or do you actually want righteousness to be done do you want everybody to learn and in the whole process everyone's dignity is guarded because unfortunately I, it's human nature it's human nature the leaders have fallen too uh, where did I get to verse 3 when I kept silent my bones became old through my groaning all the day for day and night your hand was heavy upon me my sap was turned into the droughts of summer Salah so why is David feeling feeling this way verse 5 I acknowledged my sin to you and my wickedness I did not hide I have said I confess my transgressions to Yah and you forgave the wickedness of my sin Salah it's interesting because he goes from groaning and you know like being burdened and the minute he acknowledges his sin to Yah it goes it is the confessing of transgression that resolved how David felt in verses 3 and 4. Because like, it, it is, he starts the whole thing, blessed is the man who has his sin forgiven. Because, you know, the whole incident with Bathsheba, it absolutely tore him to pieces. Read Psalm 51. You could see he was broken. And it wasn't until confessing his sin that he was able to have no forgiveness, uh, no wickedness imputed to him. But it had to be without deceit. It had to be honest. Um, therefore, let everyone, ki every kind one pray to you while you might be found. That's interesting. It, it almost implies that one day there'll be, that's it. That's it. No more. I've said this before that the grace period ends at a particular point. We've already seen how Elohim deals with the sinner with honor and with dignity. And here we see this like, Yah just wants you to confess your sin to Him. So, throughout the, let's change gears a bit. Uh, throughout the teaching so far, I don't know if you guys have picked up on this, but there's been hints to um, like, Lashon Hara, overtones of it. Like, how to, you, you can see how maybe having a fat mouth might cause all the problems that we've been talking about. 
One of the biggest ways we can cast our own and each other's honour to the ground is with our tongues. Is with our tongues. This is, every bit of shame will start here. Well, actually, it comes from the heart, but then it flows out your mouth, right? From the overflow of the heart. Let's go to Proverbs 6. Proverbs 6. We know this passage very well. Proverbs 6, verse 16. Proverbs 6. Verse 16. These six Yah hates, and seven are abomination to him. A proud look, a lying tongue, and hands shedding innocent blood, a heart devising wicked schemes, feet quick to run to evil, a false witness breathing out lies, and one who causes strife among the brothers. Now, just on a superficial Peshat level, I can connect the tongue to three of those. Like on, on an easy, you know, a lying tongue, a false witness, and one who causes strife with brothers. Strife always begins with, the, with words, always. It always begins with words. Now, you could, you could even stretch and say, hands shedding innocent blood. Are you assassinating your brother's character with your speech? Bearing false witness is shameful. It was very shameful. It is just, even we understand that on a, on, a, on a Western mindset. To lie about something and to bear false witness is shameful. The thing is, is that it's very easy to get caught in false witness when you haven't weighed the situation properly. Um, this idea of having um, not all the information, if you don't have all the information and then you go blabbing, you're actually being a false witness, or can be a false witness. It's one of the ways that the enemy uses us against, without even knowing. This is how we become unknown adversaries. Um, let's go to Proverbs 18, verse 3. We're actually going to stay in Proverbs for the, re for the rest of the teaching. Proverbs 18, verse 13. He who, sw he who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame to him. Now we read of this as, oh, it's bad, you know, but no, shame. Think on a shame culture. The minute you brought shame, everyone knew. And it, you, you had to hide your face in public almost. Why? It's all to do with Lushan Hara. He who answers a matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame. And unfortunately, if you don't weigh a situation out properly and then you start going blah, blah, we, we've all done this, right? Someone's come to us and said, this and that happened, they did this, they did that. And then you, you don't even go to the other party and then it turns out to be wrong. And quite often, like, sometimes you have to go multiple times between both parties. Sometimes it's not enough to just go once to them and once to them. It is just, but because people, this is why it's better to keep our mouth shut. Keep our mouth shut. Matthew 18, again, guard the honor, guard the privacy. This is why Elohim demands that when a matter is to be judged, it needs to be diligently sought out. You, we read this in the Torah. Uh, when a matter goes to the judges and the priests, or it, you to diligently seek it out. Why? Because quite often lives and reputations are on the line. And we've read how Yah hates it when we shame one another needlessly. This is, by the way, why a leader's judgment is harsher. Because they're, in, they're actually in danger of giving out false judgments without them realizing. This, I was thinking about this this morning. This actually means that congregants can actually be responsible for a, a leader's judgment through false witness or not weighing. It's the, it's the leader's fault as well. There's an accountability there because he should be diligently seeking a matter out. But we don't realize how much we can really infringe upon one another without even realizing it. And this is because we don't understand honor, shame, dignity. If we had this, if we understood this, we, we, we'd know how to interact with one another Lives and reputations can be on the line. Back then, I mean, people were getting stoned. You know, imagine having that blood on your hands. I, I don't want to be that person. To make a wrong judgment 
is unrighteous and unjust. It's actually shameful. It brings shame. It shames. If we're claiming to be Yah's people, we're, we're supposed to be acting in his character. And he loves right ruling and justice and mercy. Not doing this process correctly very easily leads to Lashon Hara. And one thing that, like, we think of Lashon Hara in this uh, of evil speech, character assassination, we think of it as willful, like the person knows that what they're doing. But again, let's use someone's not got the complete information and they dish out a right rule, uh, a judgment because of it, and it's wrong, and everybody starts talking about it. That wrong judgment has now caused Lashon Hara, other people, so now, do you see what I'm getting at? That leader is now guilty of causing other people to do unjust Lashon Hara. This is how serious it is, and the whole time we're completely oblivious to it. And this is what the enemy is doing. This is how he makes us adversaries, Satan's, you know, get behind me, Satan. The thing is, we don't even know where to look. We think that this is the issue, and in fact the issue is here, and the enemy is just great. He doesn't even have to do anything. All he has to do is keep your focus elsewhere. We do the rest. So we can't even blame the enemy. Proverbs 10. Proverbs 10, verse 6. Blessings are on the head of the righteous. But, a violence, but violence covers the mouth of the wicked. Now, this is interesting because we've just gone through this thing of love covers a multitude of sin. So this is righteousness, you know. But the flip side is violence covers the mouth of the wicked. It's an interesting contrast. And then it says the remembrance of the righteous is blessed, but the name of the wicked rot. Now, this is clear on a shame language. We just miss it. Because, look, uh, the remembrance of the righteous is blessed. You're remembering someone and you're giving them honor. This was a righteous person. Even post-death, people are remembered for being righteous people, for something honorable. But then he says, the name of the wicked rot. This is this idea of reputation, both in life and in death. This is clear on a shame. This actually means that the shameful wicked have violence in their mouth. Because bring verse 6 and 7 together. The violence covers the mouth of the wicked. The reputation, the name of the wicked rots. Why? Because they've got evil speech. The wise in heart accepts commands, but one with foolish lips falls. He who walks in integrity walks safely, but he who perverts his ways becomes known your reputation if you walk in a crooked way and this is all in the context of the mouth this is no one likes a gossip do they and what do people do with gossips they don't tell them anything they're like no why because they'll shame you he who perverts his ways becomes known he shames himself his honor is completely discredited um, he who winks the eye causes sorrow. So winking the eye is basically allowing sin to occur. It's not, it's allowing things to occur. And unfortunately, again, when, say someone sins against you and you do not go and do Matthew 18, you're winking the eye because you're not addressing it. You're, you're allowing it to get swept under the carpet. This would be a good modern metaphor. Don't sweep it under the carpet. And one with foolish lips falls. The mouth of the righteous is a fountain of life. But violence covers the mouth of the wicked. So again, this is showing you that a righteous person can control his tongue. And they will watch what comes out of it. An unrighteous person? Yeah. This passage is telling us that what we say either brings honor and shame. Life or death. Life or death. Proverbs 12, Proverbs 12, verse 13. In the transgression of the lips is an evil snare, but the righteous gets out of distress. Think before you speak and get yourself in a ditch. Quite often we've said something, oh, I wish I didn't say that. And then you've, you, you, then you've made your bed and you have to lie in it. 
In the transgression of the lips is an evil snare. Think before you speak. Um, right, the righteous gets out of distress. Like, this is in the context of speech, of what we say with our lips. Remember, love covers a multitude of sins. From the fruit of his mouth, one is filled with good, and the work of a man's hands is given back to him. Again, re- you will reap what you sow. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who listens to advice is wise. A fool's wrath is known at once, but a clever one covers shame. Someone who's wisdom, this is what it means to be clever there. Um, Again, think before you speak. He who speaks truth, sorry, a fool's wrath is known at once. But a clever one covers shame. Love covers. How much do we guard our brother's dignity? How much? The minute that they stumble, are we quick to, ah, they did this and they did that? Love covers. And you can speak life into the situation. He who speaks truth declares righteousness, but a false witness deceit. Wow. Wow. Again, let's remember that being a false witness is not, it doesn't have to be intentional and knowing. It doesn't have to be calculated. You could be a false witness without even you realizing it, just on incomplete information. Rash speaking is like piercings of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is healing. Again, now if love, if love, like the mouth of the righteous is covered in love, Tie all these things together. The tongue of the wise is uh, for healing. Rash speaking, it's like this is character assassination. This is what they're talking about. Shaming someone with your words. But the lip of truth is established forever. But a lying tongue is for but a moment. I'm going to go as far as saying eternal life here. The lip of the righteous is established forever. But a lying tongue is just for a moment. Just for a moment. I believe it's also actually talking about honour and esteem. Those that are righteous will gain honour, everlasting honour. Let's go to Proverbs 17. 17. Proverbs 17. And I just want to pick out a few verses. Verse 4, an evildoer gives heed to wicked lips. A liar gives ear to a tongue of desire. Now link this to a matter being diligently sought out. If you're not going to diligently seek out a matter, what, you can quite easily end up giving heed to wicked lips. Things that are unrighteous, things that are not true. A tongue of desire. This is why it's so important to weigh a matter and diligently seek it out. Because if not, we actually fall foul of being evil doers and liars. It says an evil doer gives heed to wicked lips. It doesn't mean don't cons- I'm, I'm talking of this when one party brings this and this, the listening party, doesn't weigh the matter out. You've just ended up becoming an evil doer. You share in hypocrisy. Guilty by believing and not seeking the matter out, then guilty by association. Does that make sense? We just take one person's word for it, and it could be wrong, and then... It, it, it's so subtle. It's so subtle, but man, it's so damaging. Verse 7. Excellent speech is not fitting for a fool, much less lying lips for a noble. It's talking about king kings and uh, aristocracy here. Now, if we're to be priests and kings of the Almighty, why is it that our speech is not fitting? Generally. I'm speaking very generally here. Very generally. That you've got to realise that those that are in the bride, that, that, think of Solomon and the women with the, two, with the baby, the two women. He had to make a judgment decision right there and then. I'm going to go as far as saying that the bride might have to do similar things in the millennial kingdom. Again, 
What are you paying attention to? Our speech must be fitting as well. Verse 9, he who covers a transgression seeks love. But he who repeats a matter separates intimate friends. <laughs> Lashon Harak can literally divide friends, families, fellowships. This is why Yah hates it so much. And this should bring us back to love covers a multitude of sins. Are we, does our love expect? Does it have hope? Does it endure? Does it believe? Does it have all these things? He who covers a transgression seeks love. That doesn't mean that you, you allow the transgression not to be dealt with. It just says you cover it. There's a difference. Again, how did Yah deal with sinners and with enemies, with dignity? He still dealt with the sin. Oh, yeah. He still dealt with that. But he afforded dignity. Verse 14. The beginning of strife is like the releasing of water. Therefore, stop fighting before it breaks out. I mentioned earlier that strife is initiated by the tongue. It starts from the heart. It comes out your mouth. And then in action, because of what we say, actions occur. This is how situations spiral out of control. If we were to guard one another's dignity and honor, we would have a lot less strife as any situations would be done according to Matthew 18. It would just be easier for everyone. Verse 15. He who declares the wicked right and he who condemns the righteous, both of them are an abomination to Yah. Again, this is why it's so important that a situation is diligently searched out before a verdict is given. Because we can unwittingly be abominable to Yah in trying to do good. Isn't that the very thing that Peter and Judas did? Especially Judas. He thought he was doing the world a favor. And he was an abomination. Now, again, he who declares the wicked right, this is why matters need to be diligently searched out with integrity, with honor, with respect, with dignity. I know I'm saying these words over and over, but it's so critical because not only, not only are we murdering each other, we're murdering his reputation. Again, this is why leadership gets a higher judgment because it's usually the leadership that has to pass a ruling. And again, congregants can actually make their leaders guilty of this. Without meaning to. I'm not, like, this is what's happening worldwide in the body. This is why we get denominations. This is why we get all the crap that's on the news. There's disreputing Yah in this book. We don't know where to look. And I know it's harsh to actually go through this, but we need to look at these things. Because too long, the believers have been looking here trying their best to, you know, make a, a resolve of a mess. And in fact, this is where the problem is. And unfortunately, it's matters of the heart, and that's never easy. It's never easy. Because it means that all of us have fallen foul. Last two scriptures, Proverbs 26. Proverbs 26, verse 20. For lack of wood, the fire goes out. And without a slanderer, strife ceases. So this is telling you that strife begins with slander. Le Shon Hurrah. Charcoal is for burning coals and wood to fire. So is a contentious man to kindle strife. The words of a slanderer are as dainty morsels which go down to the heart, into the inner parts of the heart. Now, what does the mouth speak from? The overflow of the heart. Now you imagine, you go around, there's a slanderer here, and he's slandering to everyone, and the wisest man that ever was is telling us that these words go down into the inner parts of the heart. Now Yeshua says it's not what goes in the mouth that defiles the man, it's what comes out. And if the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart, this means that a slanderer has the actual potential of defiling a whole congregation from the heart out. Think about that. We're not even talking like clean, unclean now. We're talking a defiled heart. 
just because of slander. And again, slander does not have to be knowing or calculated. As something as simple as not having all the facts can lead to slander. And this is how you become an unknowing adversary to the body, an unknowing adversary to Yeshua. And it divides his body. And the the, the, the church has no clue. They're wondering, why is no one coming? Because these are the sort of principles that are playing out. Proverbs 29, verse 22. And we'll finish on this. Proverbs 29, verse 22. A man of displeasure stirs up strife, and a master of rage has many a transgression. Displeasure and wrath, these are emotional reactions. This, now, these are things that cloud your judgment, and they cloud your ability to see and hear things. Again, this is why Matthew 18... Well, first, the first thing is calm down. Calm down. Think straight. And this is where offense can come in. And someone takes offense. And because of their anger, they can't think straight. Again, Matthew 18 is so important. Making decisions and judgments against people in the heat of anger and emotion leads to disastrous consequences. It, we say things in anger and they come out of our mouth and we're like, I shouldn't have said that. And then you can never take it back. You know, th- 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 this is why it's dangerous when like, husbands and wives argue because you're more prone to say something that you really shouldn't say. Once it's out, it's out. And again, the lips of a slanderer, the words of a slanderer are dainty morsels that go down to the heart and defile it. We always regret the actions birthed from this day, i.e. anger, displeasure. And this is all to do with spiritual maturity. If Steve Berkson says something really amazing. It stuck with me. He said, if you react badly in any given situation, it shows that you're not mature enough in that situation right now. A mature person doesn't react. It doesn't mean they don't feel something. I mean, you can be cut up on the inside, but I'm talking about outbursts of anger. Outbursts of anger, outbursts of wrath, these types of things. It means that you're not mature in that area. And the thing is, again, we're all guilty somewhere. This is where like calendar discussions and Godhead debates. You you want to see the maturity of a body? Start bringing these topics up. Just watch people's reactions. I've seen people literally go red in the, like, white in the, ah, over a calendar. It's like, wow. Let's, let's bring it to a close. Look, guys, how much do we love one another? John says in 1 John that if we love him, we will love those that have been born of him. It doesn't mean, now, we've linked love to liking someone. You can love someone and not get on with them. You can love some, and we're going to get into this more as we discover honor and shame and this idea of kinship. You know, Israel were commanded to look out for one another because they were a covenant people, no matter what. They'd, not all of them liked each other. But I can put my money on this that had, do you know what I mean? They would have banded, they banded together. This is very prevalent in Chinese culture and Japanese culture. They don't, they don't necessarily like each other, but push comes to war, uh, shove, they'll band together. Why? Because they're a people. They're a kinship. And this is what we're supposed to be, and we're too busy arguing and falling out over you know, petty things. And when things that are legitimate problems come around, we don't know how to deal with it. And because we don't try to guard each other's honour... All hell breaks loose. The point I want to make is let's respect and guard each other's dignity and honour each other despite our differences the same way he does to us. Because he did it to sinners. He did it to enemies and prisoners of war. Let's start showing the character of our Elohim. Amen.